Okay, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Integrated Innovation Network's virtual hub. My name's Siobhan Curran and I'm the manager of the university's I2N. Um, I acknowledge that I'm hosting this virtual networking event from the lands of the Awabakal and Waramai people. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this startup stories. I also want to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. For those of you that are new to I2N, we're all about boosting economic growth and diversity through entrepreneurship and innovation in the Hunter and Central Coast regions. Uh, we help fuel the success of innovators and entrepreneurs, be they university students, staff, alumni and the wider community and we help them to build great ventures by connecting them to the four things we know they need, which is community, coaching, customers, and capital through our innovation hubs and programs. So we manage two co-working spaces, one at Hunter Street, which is where our presenters actually joining us from today, as well as I2N Hub at Williamtown. And we have I2N Hub Honeysuckle scheduled to open in mid 2021, which we're super excited about. If you've been driving down Honeysuckle Drive, you will see on the corner of that road and Worth Place, um, some scaffolding and um, construction happening there, which we're super excited about. So at those hubs, we offer a range of programs developed to cover what we call the five stages of venture growth. And so that's right from the very beginning with enterprise skill development, um, soft skill development um, for people who are curious about innovation and entrepreneurship or just want to skill up to become corporate entrepreneurs or just become a little bit more um, dynamic in their jobs every day, all the way through to um, incubation for startups and scale ups. And that's where our guest today comes in. He's actually, he and his team are actually incubating from our hub at Hunter Street. So normally we'd be delivering this monthly event startup stories at one of our two hubs, but we've times have changed obviously, and we're here virtually. Um, so I just wanted to explain a little bit about how we're going to run today's event. So um, we've taken a number of questions at registration um, from you guys, and we'll be leading with those after our speaker provides a brief background on their startup journey. And then we'll open up to any questions that have been asked via the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And you can upvote those questions too, so we can pull from the most popular ones. So one of the good things about virtual events is that I don't need to point you to the bathrooms or the fire exits. If you're working from home or at the office already, you should know the drill. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speaker. Professor Eric Kissy, who is the CEO of MGA Thermal, a clean tech energy storage startup. So Eric and his team began their commercialization journey in CSIRO's On Prime and On Accelerate programs, where they received intensive coaching around networking, business planning, pitching, the whole shebang. And they've really gone on to test and prove their technology uh, signing a partnership with a Swiss-based, with Swiss-based E25, sorry, E2S, sorry, I did an I2N hiccup then, we get referred to as 12N a lot. Um, so they signed a partnership with Swiss-based E2S Power Ag, enabling them to repurpose decommissioned coal power plants into fossil fuel free energy storage plants. And more recently, um, they closed a seed investment round of 500K with CP Ventures, followed by a successful accelerating commercialization grant from the federal government for $495,000. And this funding is really gonna help pave the way for grid scale storage and boosting the capability of renewable energies in the future globally, which is something we're really passionate about here at the University of Newcastle and the Hunter region more widely. So welcome, Eric, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us at Startup Stories today. You might just need to start your video. Siobhan, you've stopped it. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Uh... <laughs> Let me see what I need to do here, but bear with me one sec. Here we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. There you go. Sorry about that. I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Siobhan, for the um, very gl glowing introduction, um, some of which is deserved. 
Uh, and thanks everyone for coming along to, uh, to um, have a listen to what I have to say. Um, Siobhan has uh, given me the opportunity to maybe use a few slides to illustrate a 10 minute overview of, our, of my journey or our journey. Um, so I will now share a presentation. So uh, this is our lovely template. All right, so um, I've been in the materials science game for about 41 years, uh, starting as a BHP metallurgist uh, and then uh, undertaking the PhD uh, and working as a part-time lecturer at the University of Newcastle in the metallurgy department back in the early 80s. Um, I then moved on to a national research fellowship in, uh, at Anstow doing neutron diffraction studies of materials and what's going on inside them. Uh, then I worked at Griffith University, working on hydrogen storage materials um, and began to develop a bit of an energy connection. Uh, again, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and since then I've been a lecturer, senior lecturer, etc., uh, at the University of Newcastle. So most of my most of my career has been focused on using clever techniques to study the arrangements of atoms inside materials and link that to their, their, either their manufacture, their synthesis and manufacture or their properties. So with that sort of background, you might expect that I was uh, ill-suited uh, and ill-conditioned for a, a journey into uh, commercialization and you'd probably be correct <laughs> but uh, I've sort of uh, been on a, a training program, <laughs> self-imposed for the last couple of years. Uh, how did we get started? Well, we were working uh, about nine years ago on a uh, device to, to use uh, thermionic, um, thermionic emission to generate electricity from concentrated sunlight. So that's using, basically using heat to emit electrons from a solid and then build that into a device. And as you can see from these slides, we got a reasonable way along the path. We built a device, it worked, had quite low efficiency, but it worked. And we, during that journey, came to the realization that what the world needed was not another way to turn sunlight into electricity. We already have that. What we needed was a way to store the energy um, generated by the sun and other renewable sources, and to use that to generate electricity or other forms of power in, when you need it, right? So to, to capture and store and transmit that energy at need. And so to some extent, we'd been studying the wrong problem for a couple of years, but it did help to enlighten us uh, on the need for storage. So the solution to, that we came up with after a bit of a brainstorm in the team was a new kind of material. Um, we call them miscibility gap alloys because they rely on two components which are immiscible or don't, they don't mix and they don't react. So if you look at the image at the top left, um, you've got those little blobs. Uh, they're uh, one type of metal and they're embedded within another metal. And the, the process for doing that is where our IP is, how, how to manufacture that, that structure. So when you have that structure, if you arrange it so that the, the particles have a lower melting temperature than the surrounding matrix, when you heat it up, you capture what's known as the latent heat. So that's the energy that goes into converting a solid into a liquid. You capture that, and when you um, make the surroundings colder than the storage material, you can extract that energy. Uh, from there, we've moved, um, the university patented the idea uh, quite some years ago. And um, from there, we thought, oh, okay, we'll just keep tinkering around in the lab and, and make this better and bigger and so on. And, and people will come running uh, to, to help us scale it up. Uh, government agencies such as ARENA will come running along and give us heaps of money to, to uh, improve it and get it uh, to market really fast. We just need to sit back and wait. Um, 
in fact, um, we needed to wait quite a long time. <laughs> and after about six years, we've made a reasonable amount of technical progress, but um, with some encouragement from some of the younger members of the team, particularly Alex Post, um, we figured out we'd better do this ourselves. So then we uh, started the uh, CSIRO on Prime uh, program in 2017, and uh, that uh, got us a certain way along. And then we started to uh, expand our engagement with potential customers and so on. Uh, eventually signed up for the on Accelerate uh, program in 2019, 2018, 19, uh, and um, moved on from there. We also engaged with the Newcastle Business Centre and uh, I2N, and so we've had we've had quite a bit of input from organisations such as these, and um, they are incredibly valuable as you're trying to transition into a commercialisation frame of mind. There's our CSIRO on Accelerate team. As you can see, I live in the land of the giants. Um, <laughs> I think the shortest one of them is about six foot three. Uh, all right, so the journey, uh, as Siobhan mentioned, uh, in February last year, we signed, uh, sorry, we were approached by a Swiss company with an interesting proposition, and that is to use our thermal storage material uh, to build devices which can be, uh, which can capture and store surplus renewable energy off the grid or from a nearby solar or wind farm, store that as heat and then use that to make steam and deliver that uh, to the power station, an existing power station and make essentially electricity from renewal, stored renewable sources on demand. And uh, I can go through the, the economic and technical arguments offline with people who are interested, uh, but this is more about the, the journey, so uh, I'll stick to my script. Uh, in April 2019, we founded the company. We were still in the early stages of the CSIRO on Accelerate program there. Um, in the same month, we signed a uh, memorandum of understanding with the Swiss company, SSNA. Uh, in September last year, we uh, signed an uh, intellectual property license with the University of Newcastle um, after some the usual, I would say, amount of strenuous negotiation. Um, and in fact, negotiating negotiation skills is one of the key things that anyone interested in commercialization should, should think about. Uh, 20, September 2019, we also signed a development contract with E2S. E2S is a um, partnership between the Swiss company SSNA and a very large German uh, equipment manufacturer. Uh, and as Siobhan said, we've recently taken seed funding and um, received an accelerated commercialization grant. The accelerated commercialization grant is uh, primarily targeting uh, the, the construction of a pilot manufacturing plant, which sounds large and grandiose and so on, but essentially it's to prove out semi automation and scale up of our manufacturing um, methods. And also there's some money in there to grow our workforce. Um, as the number of tasks seems to multiply uh, at five times the rate of uh, money coming in. <laughs> well, that's about it for me. Um, I don't need to talk too long about myself. Uh, I think it, it's more interesting if we, if we address some of the really interesting questions that have come in. Thanks so, so much, so much, Eric. Um, I might just ask you to unshare your screen and then we can have a little conversation between the two of us using these amazing questions that we've received. Um, so thanks so much for sharing the journey. There's a lot to unpack here. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, already in the, the live chat um, that are asking around, so the technology has been around since 2011. Do you have any suggestions to get new concepts to market quicker? It's a million dollar question. What kind of <laughs> advice would you have um, to people who are working on really deep, I, deep tech IP backed 
um, ideas and technologies and discoveries. Don't rely on a large organisation that has many other many other things to attend to, to find the customers for you or to do the, um, to do the hard yards because it te generally speaking, it won't happen that way. Generally speaking, it's your, your product, it's your idea, you're the one who's passionate about it, you're the one who can see the entire picture. Um, that, that's something I learned the hard way is that just because something's obvious to me doesn't mean it's obvious to the listener. <laughs> you really have to work hard to join all the dots and, and uh, present it in a way that makes sense to people. Uh, so you basically have to take control of the, of the, the process yourself, at least to get it far enough to find someone who can take it over for you if, if you're of that mind, or in our case, just take the whole thing on yourself and, and go for it. Yeah, I wish we'd have done it much earlier. But having said that, Siobhan, sometimes a technology has, has a time that's right for it. So energy storage, the time is right now. Everyone's desperate for it, right? Getting funded for energy storage back in 2011 was difficult, would have been much more difficult than now. Yeah, I'm so glad you raised that point because that's a huge consideration. Sometimes these inventions and discoveries, the markets either they're not there or, or um, you know, it's just a little bit too early. Um, sometimes it's very, very early too, right? So um, I think you've raised a really good point there too is actually trying to ascertain what the market potential is can often take the longest amount of time and the, you know, the largest chunk of work. Um, one of the other questions or we've got several questions specifically around the technology and I know we've got a lot of new names who I haven't heard of, who I haven't come across before who have registered. Uh, so I suspect that they work in your field and they're very interested to know a little bit more about the tech. So I thought I'd just jump straight into those questions. Um, one of them comes from Sarah Fraser, who's from CSIRO and she's asking, what was the most valuable insight you had when thinking about commercializing this technology? Um. I guess it sort of builds off my answer to the previous one. So, you know, we have the technical background to see that it made sense. We know that it's, um, we know that it's scalable. We know that it's modular and so on, but it, it took us a long time to realize that, that that's not obvious to everybody. So the story needs to be told and retold. It needs to be presented in a way that, that makes sense to the listener. So, you have to have to be able to put yourself in the perspective of the of the other person. It's not really a technical thing at all. It's it's really a communication thing. Um, the 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 and the realization, I guess, that if if this is going to happen, you're going to have to lead it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one loves their baby more than the parent, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so does the technology have domestic or residential application? This is a question from Michael Valentine from MV Solar. Yeah, it's um, because it's storing heat energy and then you have an insulation blanket around the outside. It's, it's best at a really big scale, but um, domestic or um, smaller scale commercial applications are fine, provided you're using the energy as heat directly. If you want to turn it into electricity, then you have issues around the efficiency of generating electricity from heat on a small scale. So for example, the, the smallest high efficiency steam turbine is about 50 megawatts, uh, which is you know, enough for a small city um, or small town. Uh, these days, the supercritical CO2 turbines, they might get down to five megawatts, but still large-ish scale. But if you want to use, uh, use it to store electricity from your solar panels, instead of selling that to the, to the grid, uh, you can store that as heat in our device and then use that to heat the house uh, or to, to heat up some other process that you have going on in a, in a factory or so on. So following on from that, Ben, what's the first horizon that you guys have focused on in getting this to have a commercial application? And, and are you even thinking about a domestic market further down the track? Um, yes and yeah. Uh, we had, 
okay, normally with a startup company, you start out with something this big and you sell it to the bloke down the road or the lady up the street and then you work your way up and bootstrap and so on. We've done exactly the opposite. So we've gone through no real fault of our own. We've gone for the big end of town first. The largest possible application is grid scale uh, storage associated with um, existing thermal power stations. And the way that came about is we have about seven different market segments we could use this in. So it's a quite a ubiquitous technology. Heat is everywhere. Um, all forms of energy are either heat or pass through heat at some stage. Um, so we felt like we were on this roundabout with seven exits. And we we're just going around and around. Oh, should we do electric vehicle heating? Should we do process heat for factories? Should we do waste heat recovery or grid stabilisation? Going around and around, and then suddenly up popped uh, SSNA and E2S and said, "Hey, we want to do this for power stations." <laughs> <laughs> and um, admittedly, power stations in Europe are a bit smaller, but yeah. So, so that's how we got to be. That, that that's the segment we've chosen first. Is the biggest. Um, it's also one that has a lot of money. Uh, it's also one that has a very urgent need for storage. So it, it's, it's not a bad match. Um, but sometimes choosing where to go first it really comes down to who's going to pay you. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong there. Um, we've got a question here from um, Saeed Sedar. Sorry if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. They're from Providence Asset Group and they're asking, what kind of heat exchange does this concept of thermal storage use and what is the maximum operating temperature? Uh, so, uh, miscibility gap alloys are, is not a single material. There's a whole range. It's a class of materials. So, we can make a miscibility gap alloy that targets particular temperatures. So the hottest one we have is about uh, 1,400 degrees, but that's not a particularly useful temperature for most processes, it's too hot. Uh, and the, the price of all the other infrastructure around it goes through the roof. So we typically target uh, steam cycle temperatures, 600 degrees, 550, 600, uh, 400, uh, and so on. Uh, the heat exchange is, uh, it's very, um, uh, it, it's very agnostic to how, how you get the energy in and out. So you can, you can hit it with a concentrated solar beam and, and heat it directly. You can use electric resistance to heat it, uh, or you can use a traditional heat transfer fluid to heat it. Uh, and the, the energy gets, distributes itself through the storage material by conduction. So. I guess I didn't mention earlier, the, the materials are very highly conductive. Um, the thermal conductivity is about 100 times what other thermal storage materials is. So that greatly simplifies the system. You just need a source of heat somewhere and it will distribute itself through the material. Um, I've got a question here from Dane Steggles from Benedict Recycling, and he's asking a really great question. Are there any reuse or circular economy parameters to the materials that are used? Absolutely. So another good thing about the tech is that it's, it's relatively simple compared to what I used to work on. And um, yeah, there are, there are tricks and technology in, in getting it to do its thing. But um, what you end up with is a material composed of two components that don't mix. So if you want to separate them and recycle them at the end of life, that's, that's really quite simple. Um, if they're both metals, you just melt it <laughs> and then solidify it again and they will be separate. That, that's one of our difficulties. If the whole thing melts, then they... they um, uh, uh, if one of them's a semi-metal, then you can use a mechanical means to extract it. So we use simple and safe starting materials. Uh, they remain separated within the material, so you can separate them at end of life. And indeed, if you're finished with the storage material in its current application, you can just take it and repurpose it before you recycle it. So there's the, there's the reuse aspect. There's also the recycle aspect. That's so great. Is that a key selling point or a differentiator that you use to yeah. um, stand out when you're competing with so many options for grid battery storage right now? Uh, we try to, but really price is our main differentiator from uh, electrical batteries at the moment. Um, with, 
I mean, we're not actually competing directly with electric batteries because we, we have different time frame that we operate on, uh, different scale. Um, we, we can just keep scaling up. It's quite simple to, ju to just add more storage. Um, yeah, that's... Yeah, that's okay. Um, we've got a question from Andrew Fleming in the Q&A. He's asking, uh, he was just wondering how the Swiss company became connected to you. They commissioned a, a literature search on, on thermal storage technologies um, at a university in Europe and they hit upon our technology and listed it as one of the, one of the top ones to consider. Uh, then uh, the Swiss company contacted uh, what, part of their network, who happens to be the, um, the head of the Australian Solar Thermal Research Institute, at, um, uh, which you know, is a, a group of universities in CSIRO. He said, oh, yeah, we've been talking to those guys. Probably, probably worth, yeah, so it's basically a networking thing. Um, they, they probably would have contacted us anyway but they did check with him whether we were legitimate. And then they, they, they just contacted out of the blue. Um, so it was, was, not, was nothing we did directly other than put the word out. Uh, and we have published a few papers. So it was our published work really that led to it. And the follow on from that is uh, Dennis Silvers is asking, does the Swiss company have any exclusive global rights? No, uh, they have excluded. Well, that's a commercial. <laughs> that's a commercial secret, but <laughs> they have extremely limited exclusivity. Yes, limited to the market in which they first approached us. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, others, others will be available, subject to them generating contracts and so on in those countries. Excellent. Um, one of the other questions we've got here um, that didn't have a name attached to it is explain the difficulties an early stage startup with little or no financial backing might have. It's very tricky. <laughs> um, we've been lucky. We have to admit, you know, we've been lucky. We've got accepted into the CSIRO on Accelerate program. That was, you know, that they had little bits of operating expenditure funding that they gave to teams, you know, $15,000. Doesn't sound like much, but it's enough to get you over a few hurdles. Um, they also were able to help a little bit with the legals around company setup and so on. So, so we, we got a leg up from there. Um, the other option available to us would have been angel investors. There are plenty of angel investors around that were interested in our technology. Um, the only caveat is that at a really early stage, they'll probably want to grab uh, a disproportionate amount of equity. <laughs> uh, sorry to any angel investors that are listening. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it is quite difficult. Um, we were also fortunate in that, you know, our developments and so on we were able to make use of the university laboratories rather than having to work in a back shed somewhere. So we're probably not a typical case. Um, friends and family, usually people do a friends and family fundraise at some stage uh, and then angel investment are the two, they're the two things, but we, we didn't have to go down that path. Yeah. Uh yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's a case by case basis, isn't it? And I think you raise an interesting point about angel investors and investors just generally. Uh, it's a lot trickier sometimes to secure funding when you're working on something that's deep tech like yours is as well. Um, yours is probably a little bit mature, more mature given the fact that it was developed over the last nine years. If, um, yeah, if go you ahead. can leverage, I was going to say, if you can leverage some of the government uh, research funding and so on. If you're in a university situation uh, or even a company situation, there are some quite generous company grants for technology development. Um, innovation connections and things like that can be used to access um, 
university expertise uh, and laboratory space and so on. Uh, so there, there are there are multiple ways to, to leverage government funding for early stage developments. It's really that middle that middle ground, the valley of death, as they call it. <laughs> yeah, <When> definitely. <laughs> um, that's actually a question that um, Abdullah Allah. Dulhadi from uh, the University of Newcastle, who's a student actually, he's asking, and we've just, you've just touched on this very briefly now about what were the initial funds or capital. Um, mm. He doesn't have any money to start his business. And from your experience, what's the best way to find a suitable sponsor or investor? Ooh. You have to develop a network of people. So that's that's been extremely valuable to us. I was someone who to my shame, used to hide in my office and my lab for decades uh, and networked only with people I worked directly with in, you know, in, in research. That's not totally true, but you, you know what I mean. I, I wasn't an extensive networker. Um, in business, you can't be that. You can't operate that way. You need to have an, uh, build a network of people, jump onto LinkedIn, um, go to the Newcastle Business Centre and talk to them come and talk to Siobhan, um, build a network of people and from among that network, something will pop up, <laughs> is my prediction. Once you get past about 50 or so, they start talking to each other and, mm. and it can build from there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the second time you've raised the importance of network uh, and, you know, products, one part of it and then, you know, being able to connect to the right people is the other part, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, we've got a question here from Dan Tui, who's a lecturer at the University of Newcastle. Um, what was the company record keeping and dealing with accountants and lawyers like? Um, we're sort of, well, it's a bit challenging to start with. The first time you look over a contract and go, oh, crikey's. <laughs> so we are lucky we have a good legal team. Um, they're in Melbourne, strangely enough, but um, they specialise in startups and IP-based uh, companies, uh, and they're they're really good. They, by working with them, I've actually become reasonably good at looking at contracts myself. So I always do a pretty serious pre-review. It's okay; you have to embrace it if you're going to do it. You embrace it as, oh, here's something new I'm going to learn. Uh, it's, you know. It's not a chore. <laughs> it's not like reading a university policy. <laughs> it's, it's something new. It's going to add value to what you're doing. You know, just, just learn it. It, it. Insurance was a nightmare, I have to say. I still don't understand what our insurance policies are for or what they say. <laughs> we, we're working through a broker uh, and that, you know, obviously costs money. But without the broker, I'm, yeah, I, I think we probably still wouldn't have insurance because it's just a nightmare of jargon and uh, uh, overlapping responsibilities and so on. Uh, what else? Accountants. Accountants are fine. Accountancy has largely moved online into a program called Zero that everybody uses. That's Zero with an X, E X E R O. Um, it's not that hard to learn how to do the basic bookkeeping. I say that because it's not me that's doing it. Alex Post's doing it, but <laughs> basic bookkeeping, not too bad. And then, then you engage an accountant to give you the higher level uh, advice. Yeah. Uh, I think um, just following on from that, where you talk about Alex's role in the company being focused on uh, the accounting side, how did you decide which team members were going to look after what responsibilities of the company? Did it happen quite organically or was it just, um, you know, look, drawing on people's strengths or interests in company management was, able, was how you were able to define those roles? Sort of by exclusion, I guess. There's some things that only some people can do, so you allocate those and then what's left. <laughs> um, we, we, we sort of dithered, if you like, about making these decisions until we were forced to. And then we had to put together an information memorandum, you know, an investment document 
as part of the CSIRO program and we had to list ourselves as founders with a, with a particular role. So we had to really think hard about these things. So that's the hardest thing is focusing your mind on something um, as sort of uncertain. You know, scientists, engineers love to be, you know, precise. We want to measure this. We want to measure it to six decimal places. No, that's not business. There's nothing precise at all about any of it. Um, you have to go with your your best, um, the best that you know at the at the time, and and it'd be adaptable. Um, so we have changed roles. I was the chief scientific officer now, uh, because we were told that I shouldn't list myself as a CEO because um, that's more of a you know professional management type role. So I was the CSO, but now I'm realised that what I'm actually doing is the CEO role, and why shouldn't I list that right? <laughs> investors don't like to see a company without a CEO of some yeah. kind. <laughs> I was going to say, if it wasn't you, who else would it be? Uh, hopefully you had someone else yeah. on the team in mind. Uh, Alex is doing quite a lot of management tasks and um, he's, he's currently our chief technical officer, so he's in charge of getting the pilot plant um, organised, you know, finding premises, deciding on which equipment to buy, all of that sort of stuff as well as doing the financial. So he's also our chief financial officer by default. We've reached a stage where now we can probably um, pay an accounting firm to be virtual CFO for us for a, reasonably, for a reasonable price. Um, so that, that will take a load off, off Alex. Uh, and Larry's got a great question here, Larry Wilson. He's asking what aspects of finding business support or direction as well as funding were the hardest to find yet should have been more readily accessible? Yes, I've got a good answer for this one. Um, there, are, there are accelerator programs such as the ones we did. And as, as you mentioned, Siobhan, they've focused on, you know, pitching and gearing up all those things that are exclusively part of a startup business. But what they don't contain is all the background business skills that people in our situation also don't have. So, um, uh, well, hang on, I made a list. <laughs> uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of running a business, financial management, bookkeeping, human resources systems, payroll systems, tax obligations, insurance, negotiations, contracts, leases. I mean, I'm shocked to hear from a recent business graduate that they don't study contracts in business degree. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess it's, it's a law, it's a legal thing. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. Um, maybe Dan Tui, who I, I'm not sure if he's listening in right now, who asked a question earlier, might be able to, um, to answer that one for us or in the chat. But um, I guess, you know, there's this, you know, we, we see it a lot, particularly with academic um, backed uh, startups, is that you've obviously got the amazing domain expertise in engineering, science, whatever it might be, and not so much the business skills. Mm -hmm. Is the, did you ever think about bringing on somebody onto the team who did have that business management expertise or, um, or, or not? Like, was it, look, let, we just got to learn this ourselves. So let's, let's jump in. We, we thought about it uh, and we even interviewed a few people. Um, most of them wanted to come on and take a fairly large chunk of equity in return for, for that. Uh, and you can't really just sign someone up <laughs> on that basis uh, without knowing what they're, you know, without really deeply personally knowing what they can contribute. And as we've been going along and building up, uh, we we look at ourselves pretty hard, and we're not doing too badly. So we think, well, we're probably not at the size where we need a professional CEO to come in uh, yet. Um, there is part of our accelerating commercialisation grant is to employ a business development manager, so someone who um, can help us with that side of things, but not. Um, not be running the ship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally understand. Um, you kind of raised a really interesting point earlier, you know, when 
academics are super focused on their research and doing publications and getting research money in to be able to conduct, to conduct their research. They're often in the cave, you know what I mean? Working and networking with the people that have the domain expertise they have, um, you know, whether it might be international uh, conferences or within their own faculty. Um, and you're sort of saying, you know, you kind of have the blinkers on, right? And um, how would, would you give advice to, you know, early mid-career researchers coming through the ranks now to do a little bit differently, maybe thinking more about doing some industry networking to find those potential real world applications for technology and opening up, you know, um, or being able to communicate, I guess, a little bit more effectively to the plain language speakers about what it is you're working on and, and, and the impact that it could potentially have in the real world. I, I would recommend that. Um, if, if you think that you're working on something that has a technological or a, a community impact kind of um, outcome eventually, I would recommend it for people who want to go down that path. So there will always be a place for people who just want to mine deeper and deeper into the same sort of science or, or engineering. But if you, if you are the sort of person who connects your, wants to connect your work with, with what we can call real outcomes, um, not papers and grants, uh, you, sh you should engage. Because one of the things you realise once you start uh, looking around and what a lot of the teams on, on, in the On Accelerate program learned was they've been chasing the wrong market. The, the customers just weren't there for the thing they were trying to push. It might have been a great invention, but there was either no market for it or the market was completely different from what they expected. So if you're not talking to the customer, you don't have a product. <laughs> Um, it's a really critical early step, isn't it? And it's one we bang on a lot about um, with the I2N programs that we run is, you know, there's no point. You, or you're obviously going to have assumptions about who is going to benefit from your new invention um, or your new idea, uh, but you need to go out and test those assumptions. So I suspect on Prime was super critical in being able yeah. to do that for you guys. Did you have... Did, did you have wrong assumptions about who your who you thought your your first users or end users or beneficiaries might be? We we actually had a market in mind. We we were targeting concentrated solar thermal electricity generation when we when we started out. So our thermionic emission device was targeting them to instead of using a steam cycle, you can make electricity directly. Um, and our, our storage was targeted at them and we had some fairly strong blinkers on about, you know, what, where we were heading and so on. Turns out they are not particularly interested yet, right? It's a really good technology for that application, but there's already an established technology that, that has many flaws, but you can buy it. You know, there are companies who will come and install it. Who wants to pay for a new developing technology? if you can already buy one. Yeah. doesn't matter if it's twice as good. <laughs> yeah, I guess getting, uh, you know, we were talking about timing being really critical for technology. It's also changing people's behaviours. Like if there's something already in market that does the job, what's yes. making your inventions so compelling that would make them want to change how they do things? In order to get people to change their behaviour, you need your technology to be at a technology readiness level of about eight or nine. And <laughs> what, were you, what was your TRL going into on Prime? Was it because you've been four, working on it for quite some time? Probably four, something like that. Yep. Um, it's probably now at a six. Um, it depends because in terms of our material, um, it's it's six or even seven, but once you start packaging that up in a device, it's the TRL of the whole device that, that dominates the sales conversation, right? <laughs> Hence um, why the, the recent funding that you've got for the being able to develop out the prototype and test it is yes, we have, critical. Yes, yeah, we have other prototyping with the E2S people from Switzerland to demonstrate their part of the technology getting the heat in and out and so on, but I can't make an announcement about that because it depends on, <laughs> I need permission from a, a body that can create heat really fast <laughs> locally. Right, right okay. I won't say any more about that. 
<laughs> um, we've got a really great question here from Brett Jenkins, who's from Umwell. He's asking, um, or he's, he's, he's asking, I can see this field of work is a parallel to speculative mineral exploration in that it's unproven and carries some investment risks. Have you considered the public listing business model often used by mineral exploration companies to generate development funds? I thought about this question. <laughs> we, um, we haven't really looked at it strongly. We always assumed that we would remain a, a, um, a, a privately owned company until we reach a certain size. And then the usual process is that the founders will exit and then whoever takes it over can decide whether they want to list it or not. Listing really early um, comes with a, a sort of a risk. You might get a whole heap of capital and you may not be ready for that capital. You have to time, you have to, you have to be able to deliver on what you say you're going to deliver. Otherwise the share price will go through the floor. Um, I don't know um, that we'd be really prepared to take that risk at this stage. It's, it's really, we're, we're, we're still basically scientists and engineers. We, we're not going to say we can deliver X unless we're relatively confident we can deliver, you know, at least X minus one. <laughs> uh, so it's, it, it, you know, it, it, there are companies I could point to in, even in our space that have overcapitalized early with grandiose promises and are now in serious trouble. And um, I, I really don't want to go down that path. Um, Sounds like a sensible approach. Um, and sort of following on from that, um, we've got a great question from Tuan Lam, from, who's from Brink, and they're asking, what is the timeline to commercialise and deploy at scale? Okay, so um, as they correctly um, discerned, there's, there are some fairly lengthy timelines here. So currently we're producing storage modules that are hold Individ an individual block holds about uh, two kilowatt hours uh, of, of energy. Um, by the middle of, well, around about May next year, the design of the device to be retrofitted into coal-fired power stations should be finished. That's the, the design and the proofing out and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, the aim is to have uh, demonstration unit inside an operating power station by the end of next year. And then um, the beauty of it is it's a scalable technology. So you put a 50 uh, or say you put a 10 megawatt unit into a power station, you're supplying 10 megawatts of energy, they're still getting the rest of their energy from fossil fuels. Then you put in another 50, then you put in 100, then you put in another couple of hundred and then you know, a few years down the track, they're not burning any fuel at all. The whole model um, also depends on the rate of growth of renewables in the market. And so that's, that's a, a tricky thing. We need to bring the renewable energy producers in. If you're investing in renewable generation at the moment, you might look at the market and say, yeah, but we're going to be curtailed, right? So you, you're generating a salt from a solar farm at midday Mm. So is everybody else, right? So in, in the very near future, and it's already happening, people are being told to switch off their solar farm because there's no demand for the electricity, right? So if you're investing in solar, you need to know that there's a market for that electricity. And that's, that's one of the things we provide, right? But we have to connect. <laughs> it depends on the, the energy landscape in each country as to whether, how well connected those renewable generators are with the traditional generators. Um, sometimes they're the same company, sometimes they're fierce competitors, sometimes there's, you know, they're all under government control. Um, sometimes there's no structure whatsoever. <laughs> Sounds like some interesting uh, challenges, which I guess as an international company, um, any, any international company has to recognise that there's not just cultural differences, but 
um, you know, governance and uh, mm -hmm. a whole range of different issues. So I, I wonder if it almost feels like having to go through the same, pro like every, every new market you enter or every new country that you're deploying in, you're kind of going through this um, reoccurring <laughs> process <laughs> <laughs> of trying to understand the marketplace and all of the the nuances around that. Yes, that that's that's definitely it. And hopefully, by the time we're in too many companies, we'll have people whose job it is to do that, yeah. <laughs> rather than uh, doing it uh, myself and and with Sasha Savage, the um, CEO of B two S. Um, the good thing is that we're partnered with Europeans, and Europe is a fairly it's not a single market, but it, well, it's sort of a single market, but also tends to do things similarly between different countries, at least when it comes to big things like energy. Um, some of the big energy companies there like uh, NL own assets across all of Europe. Um, so it's- Was that it's, something you were conscious of when you, or like you, when, when you got tapped by this European company, you're thinking, great, because we know it's going to be a little bit easier than somewhere like, you know, South America or elsewhere. The motivation for them going down this path is that Germany has mandated the closure of all its um, coal-fired power stations. And so those assets will be sitting idle or worse, billions of euro each for decommissioning will have to be spent on them. So. The expectation is that there will be money associated with any kind of repurposing <laughs> of these assets. So again, a timing yeah. issue, right? Like yeah. if it wasn't for the G German government making that policy, do you think mm. you might have received the traction you've got so far in Europe? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. We would probably uh, be going down a different path. So we were chasing electric vehicle heating at one stage, but that's a really hard gig. Uh, people probably may not recognise, but in cold climates, your electric vehicle has to drain the battery in order to stop the people inside from freezing. And that, that energy is no longer available to propel the car. So um, they estimate some up to 40% of your battery is used heating the cabin rather than um, rather than propelling the vehicle in winter. And so you have range anxiety uh, creeping in. Uh, and so we were going to provide a thermal battery to do the heating of the vehicle and then um, leave the electric battery to do the propulsion. Uh, but getting any traction in that market is quite difficult. And the design, the design cycle is sort of five years. So the thing, the thing you start developing now won't be in a car for five years until five years hence. Yeah, sure. Um, we've got a question here from Glenn Downey, who's actually one of our mentors in our venture mentoring service. And he's asking, could you elaborate on the lessons that you've learned with respect to negotiation, particularly with respect to IP negotiations with the University of Newcastle? I was fortunate enough that um, as part of their follow on support, the CSIRO on Accelerate team uh, paid for me to do a negotiations training course in Brisbane. And there are a number of key lessons to take from that, but probably the, the most basic and important one is that you have to try and understand, you have to understand exactly what you want out of the negotiation and, and what your ranked order for those outcomes is. And you also need to know what the other side needs out of this negotiation. Don't assume that their goals are the same as yours. Mm. They, they have completely different KPIs and completely different um, needs, if you like. The university is primarily a, a teaching institution and research is, a, is very important, but it's not, you know, it doesn't bring the bulk of the operating cost in. Um, the university wants things that improve the university's profile. They want, um, they don't want to be out of pocket. <laughs> they want, you know, they want good stories. They want their research to be used to, to make international or national or international um, traction, you know, to do good in the community, those sorts of things. Primarily not motivated by money. <laughs> Um, I think that might be changing soon. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
and and really startup companies you know your motivation is the freedom to operate you want a license that allows you to operate and do what you do that that's your key thing don't worry too much about financial arrangements and whatever you know it some universities the the ip and this is probably a historical thing but the ip was the ip terms were set by legal people with no real concept of what commercial landscape is like outside so be honest about what's driving you and what your motivation is if if someone proposes something which is untenable in a commer in commercial terms tell them go to a couple of investors and say would you sign up for this term sheet and if they say no that's completely uninvestable then you feed that advice back in and and make sure that everybody on both sides has as much information as possible without giving away you know commercially sensitive things um, that's my advice so if you understand the other side and you make sure they understand exactly what you need them to understand that's that's that smooths the path in negotiations a huge amount and that's not only ip negotiations it's all kinds of negotiations um, the, the, the greatest mistake to make in, an, in a negotiation is to assume you know what the other side wants. <laughs> yeah, and I guess you learn that too from um, all that customer discovery that you do at the very beginning as well. You learn so much about um, how, yeah. how radically wrong your assumptions can be. Absolutely. Um, we've got a question here. We've only got a few more minutes left, so I just wanted to quite jump in maybe two more questions here. I've got one here from Joseph O'Neill who's asking, as you do more international business, have you had to overcome an imposter syndrome that people can have coming out of smaller Australian cities? I suffer from that throughout my life. <laughs> I, don't I really don't understand how I got to be a professor. Um, but yes, um, it, you do have to slap yourself some mornings and think, oh, I'm talking to these people in, you know, giant companies or people who have, you know, one of the, the, the business development person on the E2S team used to run um, General Electric in Germany. <laughs> um, there's, you know, there's people there who've got a really serious amount of experience and, and influence and so on. Um, so yes, it, it, it is difficult um, and people who have chosen a university career are not usually flamboyant out there people, typically I would have thought. Uh, and so it, it is difficult, yes. But, you know, every time you look back, you do a bit of a review of your progress over the last six months or progress over the last three months even, you realise you can do this and we are doing it and it's going to happen um, <laughs> despite feeling like it's, <laughs> it's a dream. <laughs> I guess um, there's, a, there's a really great article that came out recently from the Netflix co-founder who basically said, nobody knows anything. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're all in the same boat. We're all pretending like we know what we're talking about. Um, but more often than not, people just don't know and they're making it up as they go along. Um, I've got a great question here from Alex Vary, which might help us wrap up. Um, he's asking, has Australia now gotten itself a great businessman and lost a great research innovator? I'd like to think that the two aren't mutually exclusive and that we might see you back researching again one day. But what, what are your thoughts around that? Um, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm, pretty set, I'm pretty far down the transition into, into the business world at the moment. I still have that curious mind that wants to know how things work all the time. And in our business, there will always be a research component, but I know what you mean. Um, who knows? Who knows? I mean, if we get this, this business we're chasing, I don't want to lead a, a $200 million company. I don't think I have the skills. So at some point I'll have to step back into a purely technical role and a research role. So yeah, maybe. I guess like you never knew you might, you know, 10 years ago have, you know, be the CTO or the, the CEO of a company. You, you mm. just don't know what's around the corner, right? No. 
No, well, I don't. Alex, thank you so much for, um, sorry, Eric, sorry, I was looking at Alex's question then. Eric, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fascinating, huge interest. There are many, many questions that we have not gotten around to, um, to answering today, uh, but we'll forward those on to you. And uh, if, if you have the time or inclination to be able to respond to them, we can share those with, uh, with our participants today. Um, I'm just going to jump in now and just uh, let people know uh, a couple of things that we've got coming up um, at the I2N uh, here. Um, bear with me one sec, sorry. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, oops, my PowerPoints. So, um, for those of you that might be interested in undertaking a very similar journey uh, like Eric, um, we have the validator program. So this is very much um, uses the same methodology as CSIRO's on prime program um, called Lean Launchpad, but it's open not just to research teams, but uh, interest uh, or a new idea or an invention that they want to explore the market potential of. Uh, and so I would highly recommend checking out validator applications actually close this Sunday. Um, and so if you want some information on that, head to our website to check it out. We've also got applications or expressions of interest open for our venture mentor service, not just for ventures. Uh, you have to be UN affiliated in some way. So student staff or alumni, uh, the founder of a company, you can make an expression of interest to participate and get advice from our amazing teams of mentors. But also if you um, want to become a mentor yourself, we're also taking expressions of interest for mentors to participate within the program as well. Uh, our next startup stories is happening on the first Wednesday of next month, 2nd of September. It's with Phoebe Breckel, who is the founder of a uh, local uh, company called Happy Skincare. So if you're one of the many people who are making the move um, from traditional deodorants and skincare products to much more healthy and sustainable products, I highly recommend checking out uh, Phoebe's journey next, next month. Um, and then tonight we've also got an information session. The grand challenge is back in 2020. Uh, there's over $50,000 in funding available for teams to be able to pursue their idea for solutions or potential solutions, research projects, businesses, social enterprises that may address the challenge of mosquitoes. If you're at our Callahan campus, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but we also know mosquitoes have a huge global impact as well um, from a, a health risk perspective. Um, so we've got an information session on tonight if you'd like to know more about how you can get involved. Um, but the first stage of that program is actually called the Idea Spark competition. Um, and we're giving away 10 $500 cash vouchers to the best seeds of an idea or spark of an idea for the challenge of global mosquitoes. That um, challenge commences on Monday and it's open. We've got applications open for two weeks. You can head to the Grand Challenge website to check that out. And we've got a range of different workshops, skill building workshops that we're offering in the lead up to applications opening for Grand Challenge. Things like design thinking, how to build an all-star team, including tips on negotiation uh, and conflict management. Uh, and we've got a couple of others around understanding who your potential end users might be, as well as how big or sustainable your impact could be as well. Um, and we've also got some domain experts coming in talking about their experiences um, facilitating um, interventions for mosquitoes in global context. So Nothing But Nets is a UN foundation organisation that'll be joining us for an Ask Me Anything webinar in September, um, as well as a couple of others that we have too. So if you feel like you know nothing about mosquitoes, you don't need to worry about it because we've got your back in terms of giving you all the advice that you'll need. Um, so that's it from us here at the I2N for this week. Uh, we look forward to seeing you either at the Grand Challenge Information Session tonight um, or uh, at the Design Thinking Workshop next week. If you've got any questions about any of the programs uh, or incubation that we offer at our hubs, please hit us up. There's my contact details that way um, if you want to reach out. Um, thanks again, Eric. You've been an absolute legend. We're really proud of the development that you've made so far and we're really happy to have you as part of our network. Um, have a great day, everybody, and stay safe.